Welcome to Roundtail Radio. Through our conversations, we discover the holy and the ordinary, look for moments of grace and peace, and redefine what we talk about when we talk about faith. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, Leslie. Uh, welcome to February. Yes. Welcome, I've indeed. S- I've been seeing lots of things on social media about how January lasted s- eight months, yeah. and it was... <laughs> <laughs> the longest January. Such a beautiful uh, weather month. Yeah, yeah. We, we experience much, much weather <laughs> here in Connecticut. Um, but as a new month unfolds, we are also exploring another facet of our What Matters Most theme. And our theme mm-hmm. for February is justice, mm-hmm. which feels like this feels like a kind of peak moment to me in the What Matters Most series. I feel like mm. we were almost leading to it. Uh, uh-huh. As we were um, ramping up through our various themes so far, you can always go back and listen to those yes. uh, in our archives. Round Hill Radio exists forever, <laughs> so you can always go back. <laughs> um, so we're looking at justice, and justice mm-hmm. is a big word. It's a big word. Mm-hmm. It's a big word. It's a. It can feel like a complicated word, mm-hmm. I think I heard you say. So how can we break that down into... Mm bite-sized uh, pieces that help us explore it? Yep, great question. You know, I, I think that of all the words we've uh, thought about thus far, and you're right, we're, we're, we're climbing the mountain, and we're almost half of the way through our, our year-long series. So by the wow, time we yeah. conclude with justice, so maybe it's appropriate, right, that it's right here at the, at the peak, yeah. um, that we're ascending the mountain, and uh, that's... Um, of course, imagery that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used a lot, you know, going up to the mountain. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, it feels to me uh, that of all the virtues we've looked at thus far, things like imagination, generosity, gratitude, this one would probably feel most like a stretch for people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that it's probably easier to think about this virtue that not, doesn't really have much to do with me. You know, that's, mm-hmm. it's too big. This is about protest movements, and it's about political rallies, it's about uh, engaging, fighting City Hall, you know, it's all of those things. And you know, it is all of those things, but it's a lot more than that as well. And a lot of times we, I I think we forget that many times justice movements are actually composed of very, very small actions, Mm -hmm. uh, collectively making a big difference. And that's why I've been been thinking recently that sometimes when I think of justice artistically, I think of those beautiful murals that we'll see, you know, in cities sometimes. Like when you're going into New York City, take a look off to the side and there'll be this giant mural on the side of a building, you know, and Mm -hmm. declaring some particularly important truth. And I love looking at them. But justice can also be represented artistically by collage, which is usually a very small piece of art. Um, collage is made up of tiny, tiny pieces, smaller pieces that are, you know, sort of patched together, hopefully into some harmonious whole. It doesn't always work out that way. But we are all of those tiny pieces, smaller pieces. And when our collective efforts are are joined, then we can make a big difference. And a small collage can have a big impact, just like a big mural can have a big impact. Yeah. So I think breaking it down is helpful into its smaller components, because otherwise justice feels like a banner, you know, and it's, um, it may feel like, gosh, we don't even know how to, you know, take the first step up that mountain. So maybe that's what we can explore a little bit. Yeah, I think that idea of, you know, one step at a time, one little element at a time is always a nice thing. And I think too, we've, we've experienced this with other ideas, but I feel like justice the word justice can come with a lot of preconceived notions. Mm-hmm, I think you mm-hmm, were mm-hmm. you were speaking to that. And also, like you said, that idea that maybe it doesn't apply to me, yep. which yep. I think is speaking from a place of privilege, mm-hmm. uh, from a luxurious place where if I don't feel like I need it, then you're doing okay. <laughs> right, yep. Um, but I think that also, you know, it it's... It's a reminder to us to engage with this and a reminder to us that it is alive and well and needed. Um, and I was also thinking about our, um, the eco justice mm. uh, mm-hmm. work that you are doing and that we've had fellow colleagues on that are working in that field. Um, and I love that 
it is using that word as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I think mm-hmm. that it speaks to, I think you were saying that justice, you were saying this on Sunday, that justice can be another word for love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to me that I'd like, that's going to stick with me because this idea that, you know, that it's not, there's no hate there. There's no destruction there. It is creation mm-hmm. of right. justice. Um, yeah. And we were using our new hymn of the month. And I, I know we want to explore that idea some more, but our hymn of the month is uh, this fabulous congregational piece by our friend Mark Miller. And he wrote to the the text of let justice roll down like waters mm-hmm. and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And this very like water can be a force. Um, it can sure be a force can. for good. I can wear my force for good hoodie. Um, yes. And... But it's this, I love that it's roll and flow like an ever flowing stream. It's not an ever flowing like tsunami. Right. Yeah. It's a stream and it's this constant beautiful idea. To me, this idea of like a babbling brook of justice mm. just makes me feel just like, okay, there's hope right. <laughs> in the world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that uh, use staying with the water image here for a little bit, you know, yeah. that, that water is a, is powerful. I mean, and when we when we see it in its most powerful iterations, it's, it's frightening. Mm-hmm. And uh, in terms of its, creative and its destructive power. I do think that with justice, um, perhaps unlike um, some of our other virtues, there is room in justice for a kind of expression which is volatile. Um, There's room in justice for anger. There's room in justice for outrage. And we don't have to look anywhere but in the Bible to see that. All of those voices are contained within the Bible. And I think there are voices within Christianity that say, oh, you know, when you start using the word justice, you're just getting political now. You've just politicized, you've tried to politicize God. And that is not, absolutely not the case. Um, Justice, the Hebrew word mishpat, is really is about the heart of God, what matters to God. And you can see um, that God's anger burns pretty hot. Uh, quite often in our scriptures. And so justice picks that up. And I do think that if we're inclined in general to be a little more genteel, we're like, I don't know if I want to get too close to that fire. But the fact of the matter is, as you point out, if the issues come close enough to us and our lived reality, then maybe we will find a way to get angry. And I think there are some things we ought to be angry about in our world. Um, violence, uh, the prevalence of, you know, gun violence, uh, the damage that's been done to the environment. We may not like it when people like Greta Thunberg stand up and, and really, you know, accuse the world of injustice in terms of how the environment has been mistreated. But mm-hmm. what's, our, what's our, you know, response to that? I mean, she's, she's simply sa- stating the obvious. So yeah. I think, again, we just have to be prepared for a wider range of, of emotion. And I'll never forget uh, going to a presentation once by, uh, that was led by Evan Dobell, who used to be the president of Trinity College. And he gave a presentation at a church um, because Trinity College in Hartford, in the south end of Hartford, made an enormous commitment to the well-being of children in the south end of Hartford. I mean, it was just amazing how much uh, care they dedicated to that part of the city. And someone said to him, so Evan, what inspired you to do this? You know, what made the board of trustees of Trinity College decide to spend part of their endowment on the city rather than just the college? And he said, well, you probably won't want to uh, hear this, but it was anger. He said, we looked around the neighborhood and we were angry at the disparity of resources between kids living in, or growing up in urban areas and going to urban schools and their suburban counterparts. So he said, that's why we got mobilized to do something. So I, and that, that was a justice movement. And in that case, people applauded the anger, you know, they were, they were glad to hear that that was the case. But again, even that movement was made up of a lot of little tiny steps. You know, you think about all the meetings that had to take place at Trinity College with the Board of Trustees. Yikes. Probably over months and months and months um, to get to the point where they made those decisions. And, uh, and likewise, people in our congregation are very involved in some social causes where they're 
sitting in on monthly meetings. They're writing letters to their politicians, you know, probably wondering, is this going to make any difference at all? But they stick, they stick with it. So small things adding up to big impact. And I think you've hit on something really important there, which is the stick with it. Yeah. yeah, Because I think it's so easy. I I think it's comparatively easier to make a decision to be like, we're going to invest blankety blank in a cause that is important, a cause that's needed, a cause where angry exists, all those things. But then there's the not flashy, not sexy letter writing and sticking with it and calling people and you know, the, the consistent effort over years Mm -hmm. that people have dedicated to these causes of justice. I, I find that so admirable. Mm. Um, We've talked about how we, we both suffer from shiny object syndrome. (laughs) And so to me, to me, that feels particularly challenging because it's, you know, to stick with something that long and not be like, Oh, there's a new thing I could go dedicate and be part of the whoa yay we're doing it and yep. oh yay we're doing it and then the actually doing it yep. um actually committing to and actually doing the small acts um i just i have so much respect for for all those people that stick with it i agree i think one person who uh delivered that message to me in a really graphic way was the very reverend george mcleod in Scotland, uh, it was actually the very Reverend George McLeod of Funery, and he used to call himself McLeod of Buffoonery. Um, <laughs> he, he was a, so other people don't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, get out ahead of the curve. Uh, he was a remarkable man and uh, a, a great church leader in Scotland for many, many decades. But he was um, a chaplain during the First World War. And the experience so transformed him that he became a pacifist after that experience. And um, <clears throat> so uh, as the years progressed, as, as the world built up this, you know, engaged in this proliferation of nuclear weapons, he became very active in the campaign for nuclear disarmament. And every year he wanted the Church of Scotland to make a declaration at its General Assembly stating that it was calling the world to engage in the, you know, this disarmament of nuclear weapons and Mm -hmm. to back down um, from this extraordinary engagement in in weaponry. And so year after year after year, it was voted down in the General Assembly. Every year he would stand up and make a more impassioned speech than he had made the year before. Everybody would applaud it. They'd vote it down. And finally... I think he was 93 when the General Assembly for the Church of Scotland finally voted its support for the campaign of nuclear disarmament. And I mean, how many decades had that taken? And, you know, likewise, I had a friend who was a teacher in seminary, um, just really, really admired this man, Bill Holiday, And he said that every night in his prayers, he would pray for the end of apartheid in South Africa. And he was saying this during the 1980s when it didn't look like apartheid in South Africa was ever going to be dismantled, but it was dismantled. And I, and when that happened and Nelson Mandela became president of South Africa, I thought of Bill Holiday praying every single night, you know, in the, in the silence and quiet of his own life. And, and yet joined by the prayers of millions of people across the world to end this regime. And it happened. But again, stick to itiveness is a big part of justice, right? Because it really demands that kind of long term commitment. It's a it's a long haul endeavor. And maybe that's another reason why it's a stretch for us. Yeah, I could see that. It's, yeah. And um when it's maybe not something that's impacting you personally, it's hard yeah. to when there's so many other things pulling your time and attention. Yeah. Um, but that takes all that much more dedication. Um, yeah. Actually, I just want to say something quickly based on what you just said. So many things pulling for our attention. I do think that what I, when I talk with people about justice, this is one of the great challenges for them because there are so many things pulling on their attention potentially. Could be the environment, could be gun violence, could be a number of different things. Um, their question, and, and each of these issues has many sides and can feel very complicated. Um, I think that that immobilizes people, or we can allow that to immobilize us. Mm-hmm. 
Sure. And uh, so part of what we have to do is really take some time, which and that may take time on our own to think through what is the thing that's calling to us? You know, mm-hmm. is there one particular issue that is calling to us? And my personal uh, approach to this at this point in my life has been to say, I trust that God is calling many people to to stand up and become part of all of these different issues. So I don't have to be that. Mm-hmm. I think God is calling me into a particular response, and it's up to me to to really discern that and figure that out and to feel completely good about that because we can't be all things to all causes and we don't have the energy or the resources to do that. And so I think it's, I'm glad you just mentioned that. I'm really struck by you saying that because I've often, often wondered how it is that you juggle all of the important and necessary things that pull your time and the things that can be a big impact in the world and how you professionally, right, in your ministry, <laughs> how you figure out what gets mm. oxygen mm-hmm. and what, how to how to juggle all those things. Because I know there's a lot of people with a lot of different passions in our community mm-hmm. um, and that they want you on board with mm-hmm. their passion, I, which I understand completely. Um, how do you handle that? I'll tell you, it's a good thing I took juggling lessons back <laughs> in the- <laughs> <laughs> that I need to see. I need to yeah. see that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I only have three juggling balls. So uh, if there's anybody asking me to do anything beyond that, it doesn't even come into the into the mix. You know. There you go. That's an easy way to do it. <laughs> well, I've gotten a whole lot better at saying no. That is for sure. Mm. And I can say to people now, quite honestly, you know, I really respect that that is a passion for you, and I appreciate the fact that you've invited me to be involved. But I'm actually really involved over here, and then I will say something about that. I think the clearer we are with people, the better they understand. Uh, But it it is an interesting question because uh, recently I was talking with someone who works in uh, the area of organizational management, and she was asking me about my goals for uh, 2024. And of course, I listed about, you know, 11 things. And she said, no, you get three of those. So you go ahead, (laughs) you choose any three you want to, but that's where you are. And, um, there's something very liberating in that, um, and I feel so much better about doing it at this point in my life than I probably would have, you know, a couple, three decades ago. Sure. So I do think that we have to, because the other side of this is that not only do we have the cause that we're trying to address, but we're trying to strengthen the organization of which we're a part mm-hmm. so that it is able to address the cause. And um, this is something that often gets lost, you know, working on organizational development can be tedious, but if you don't have the, the good foundation for your community to be able to do its work, if you're not recruiting new members and funding it, what's there, right, yeah. to, do, to do the work that needs to be done? And I, I've got a big, um, you know, shout out to Bill McKibben, who is organizing the group called Third Act. That's a nationwide organization with working groups in every state. It's mainly for people 60-ish and over. Um, But, you know, that's 70 million people across the United States of America. And I think he's saying no to a lot of things because he has just dropped anchor right there. And Mm -hmm. it feels, it can feel like a loss to do that, but it can also feel very freeing to say at this point in my life, this is where I have to be. So I, I try to say no as respectfully as I can mm-hmm. and then try to do the best that I can to engage both the institutional strengthening and direct action towards the cause that I care about. Yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't say that we have a great podcast with Bill um, yes. from a few months uh, back. So you can grab that, uh, go through our library, easy to find. Um would you say that eco justice is right now your big where you've dropped anchor in terms of your own justice ministry? It is without question. Yep. And, um, and you know, as you point out, it's, it, it's not easy to say no to other, uh, calls right at this point, yeah. but there's no question that that has risen to the surface. And I'm very proud of the board of trustees of Round Hill Community Church who initially, um, you know, gave me the freedom to dedicate 10% of my working time on Echo Justice Matters. So I, 
I really applaud that action. I don't think I've met another colleague yet. Uh, I, I had one colleague who inspired me to do that, who'd been given that, you know, that space by his employer. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's funny also, I will just say this. When I came back from sabbatical in 2018, a member of the congregation, I, I met him for lunch and a very thoughtful person who's had a very positive role in my life in the congregation. And he said, he asked me your question. He said, what is it now? And I said, there's no question, but it's, it's go, you know, really engaging echo justice issues. And when I said it, I kind of, I was like, I was, you know, hearing myself as like a split body experience. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, do you really mean that? Really? I mean, I could hear myself asking that question. Interesting. And here we are five years later, and I, I did mean it. <laughs> so that <Hey>. was, <laughs> that, that's, that's affirming. <laughs> but that's where it is, for sure. Yeah. And I think the community has really rallied around it. And I've mm. found, I mean, this is the first place I've worked where it's been, there's really been like a, a center call. Mm. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. beyond just good ministry you know yeah. i'm not gonna throw my other churches under the bus um <laughs> yeah doing good ministry and doing good and in, yep. in heartfelt meaningful ways but not in that there's a, a lightning rod in this yeah. way yeah. um and a lightning rod so much bigger than the building we're in right Right. You know, this idea that we're talking about a planet. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. Know? Right. Um, this is this is everything. Yeah. It's yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a woman I worked with for a while, just a brilliant individual who was an executive coach. And she I love the way that she used to ask this. She said, you know, when people tell me that they've got commitments to, to something, um, she would say, has it soaked into your congregation's charter? You know, so you like picture ink soaking into a document, yeah. actually coloring the paper a new color. You know, if it hasn't soaked in, then she would say it's not part of the congregation's culture yet. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's soaking in um, and it's and it's like spreading out. And that is something that we want to try to figure out how to encourage at every step. So there's a sort of a saying that goes around the church musician world which is if you want to know a church's theology look at the hymns they sing mm, mm -hmm. what are they singing because mm -hmm. that will tell you everything you need to know mm. and i've been st stunned is kind of a strong word but it's, it's not that far off that when we've been you know these past couple months we've been looking at justice and mm -hmm. peace and you know we're looking at these ideas and I've not, I was a little worried that I would have trouble finding hymns mm. mm -hmm. and I have not had that problem. Mm. I will especially mm. say, I mean, we're, we're early in February still, but for January, I was like, which of these 70 hymns do we want to sing? <laughs> because we sing about peace all the time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We sing. And the thing is also we sing about the earth all the time. Uh -huh. Um, and and mm -hmm. now looking into justice, it's not a struggle to mm. find because sometimes, you know, sometimes pastors give their organists kind of esoteric, <laughs> poetic <laughs> themes. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you're not a, a lectionary following church. Um, and so you just sit there like, mm. what? What is it? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I will sometimes go to you and go, can you tell me a little bit more about what yeah. you're thinking? Flesh <laughs> this is, out a little. Yeah, which yeah. is code for I don't I don't know what you want from me in this moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably because I don't either. <laughs> no, that's fair. So um but it's been really interesting to see that through thread of mm -hmm. what we're singing about, what we have been singing about, that we have been singing about peace, that we have been singing about justice, and we've been singing about our world. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something to celebrate. Yeah, I would that agree. It's part of our theology. I would say that if your theology, again, is if it's not only soaking into the charter, but it's soaking into your hymns, and it can be reflected there, 
that you're on the way to integrating it. You know, you can speak about the topic with integrity and, yeah. uh, and I would agree. And I think that that's the journey of justice. You know, we, I, I just love the fact that during the civil rights movement in this country from the fifties all the way up into the seventies, so much of it was driven by song. Mm -hmm. And I think in the end, that's, that's really, you know, if we keep finding the songs to sing, that will help us to stay on the journey to justice. Yeah, actually, in February, on Sunday mornings, we're going to be exploring some of those songs. We're going to be exploring some of the songs from from slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and our colleague, Risa, who is an incredible musician, um, she has some resources that's going to help us sing with knowledge, sing with context. Mm -hmm. um, because I've always, I think I mentioned, I mentioned this last week, I can't remember. Um, I always really cringe and I feel deeply uncomfortable about a um, white church, especially a frankly wealthy white church, singing songs of oppression, mm. singing mm -hmm. songs about being oppressed. I have a real problem with that. <laughs> um, and I think that when we give those pieces context, mm -hmm. that's sort of, sort of, this has been my journey with this, is that when we learn and we sing and we are, we are, putting ourselves in a mindset, we're putting ourselves in other people's shoes, then we're having a transformational experience and we're learning through song. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to be exploring that a little bit in February on Sunday mornings. I, I think it's exciting. And, you know, probably uh, it wouldn't come to mind most cases to think about justice as a journey also that involves appreciation mm. uh, for texts for songs and how they were created and who developed them. Because I think many cases, you know, if we could ask the, the first singers of the songs, the, 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 the song creators, you know, they would probably have said they wanted those songs for everyone, but it's hard for us to, you know, to connect with them for all kinds of reasons, distance of time and experience and privilege and all of that. But if we can sing those songs with like a third ear, you know, mm -hmm. listening, overhearing ourselves uh, as we're singing them, then I think we're connecting with the people who created them. We're not connecting with their experiences because we can't do that. But we can connect with the imaginative impulse that created them. And then it, it ideally it would draw us into greater communion or solidarity with people in the world who could, who could genuinely sing those songs from a standpoint of oppression or mm -hmm. being on the receiving end of violence or neglect or what, whatever it might be. So I think that uh, accessing the songs, which is what you're talking about, giving them context, you know, living into them a little bit, respecting the difference, but also trying to hear those original voices. That's a, it's a really, it can be a really important way of deepening our, our justice journey. I think so. And, and, you know, saying those words singing those words like we've said before music has a way to get text into your heart into your mind in a way that's yeah. so much deeper i find Agreed. um and so i think that like you said music is going to be such an interesting way to explore explore justice and explore it through february and explore it beyond as we say it's a it's a ladder it's a ladder of uh <laughs> of ideas that we keep adding to uh throughout this entire year of what matters most Amen. Final thoughts for this morning. And hey, the journey awaits, right? There's always a place for everyone on the justice train. And uh, there's always a, a letter that can be written from home, as well as a sign that can be made and walked out in protest and everything in between. So I think, I think we can find our way to uh, join everything that God is trying to do with uh, God's heart for justice. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ed. And thank you one thank and you. all for uh, joining us today. We are excited to be on this journey with you. Please always feel free to contact us. Uh, the Roundhill Radio was brought to you by the friends and members of Roundhill Community Church. For more information, please visit roundhillradio.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are a few things that you can do that would make a big difference to us. Like the video, subscribe if you aren't, and click the notification bell and select all. Thank you.